I study national security law and policy, especially uh, how we can keep our national security policy in line with human rights and democratic values. My recent work has focused on the legal treatment of political violence. We're at a moment now where we're having a national conversation about what seems to be a rise in white nationalist violence, and my scholarship considers how historically and today uh, we categorize and treat uh, terrorism and other forms of violence under the law. U.S. criminal law differentiates between what we consider to be international terrorism and domestic terrorism. International terrorism, broadly defined, is seen as terrorism threats with some international connection or terrorism that transcends national boundaries. Domestic terrorism is seen as terrorism that uh, is focused on the U.S. in terms of its origin and impact. But one issue is that the way that we actually apply these categories has more to do with identity and ideology than with geography. So for instance, we see threats of terrorism stemming from American Muslims within the United States as international, while we see threats of terrorism stemming from white nationalists as domestic, even if they're virtually identical in terms of their actual location. The legal divide between domestic and international terrorism has multiple historical roots, so it can't be pinned on one particular event or circumstances. One reason is that in the years after 9-11, there was an overwhelming focus on international terrorism in light of the threat posed by Al-Qaeda. So the U.S. launched a global war on terror uh, abroad and within the United States engaged in intensive surveillance and prosecution within Muslim communities. Uh, but another reason for the persistence of this legal divide is that it taps into our deep-seated tendencies to uh, divide between insiders and outsiders on racial and xenophobic lines. So for instance, because we see Islam as foreign uh, and as uh, in opposition to American identity or values, we easily characterize American Muslims presenting a threat of terrorism as part of an international threat whereas we see white nationalists as domestic because at some level we see members of a dominant community as one of us. So since 9-11, the U.S. has used an aggressively preventative model to terrorism when it comes to threats posed or suspected or believed to come from within Muslim communities. And the idea is that you cast a wide net of suspicion in order to root out potential threats long before they actually materialize. The problem with this approach is that you end up surveilling large communities and incarcerating individuals who may never have presented an actual threat. And in this process, the government has used national security warrants uh, to, uh, from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, it has sent out uh, thousands of informants into American Muslim communities to investigate. Uh, it has deployed material support to terrorism charges with very lengthy prison sentences, even if the connection to violence uh, is remote or attenuated. And by contrast, we've used a more traditional law enforcement approach to threats of domestic terrorism with conventional forms of investigation and search warrants uh, and uh, conventional criminal charges. So the recent spate of mass shootings and attacks motivated by white nationalism from Pittsburgh to El Paso have really brought to public light the seriousness of the threat posed by white nationalist violence. Uh, and we see greater recognition among the public that that threat is one of political and systematic violence. In other words, it fits what we think of as the textbook definition of terrorism. Uh, it is inflicted in order to intimidate a civilian population for political ends uh, and to influence the conduct of government. The concern in the policy conversation that's now emerging is that uh, people are seeking to use the regime that we have used for international terrorism and to then apply that to domestic terrorism. And without examining the fairness 
and uh, lack of accountability and oversight of the existing regime for international terrorism, expanding it still further, creates more problems than it solves. Policies that are passed, especially in times of fear, uh, often have broader and unintended consequences. We may think now that new measures that are passed to confer greater authority in the federal government to fight white nationalist violence uh, may be used specifically for that threat. But if history is any guide, the fallout from broad national security related powers and criminal law powers often falls on marginalized communities and political activists and dissenters. So in considering our laws on terrorism today, we need to be mindful of that broader historical context and the consequences of uh, the powers we choose to adopt.